Hey everyone, Jared here. Today we've got a special episode about a special show, Rick and Morty. Every episode is chock full of references to sci-fi, horror, and fantasy. From the aliens, to the premises. It's like The Purge, Morty. That, that movie, The Purge. To the gadgets. Go, go, uh, Sanchez ski shoes. The list is endless. While many of these references are throwaway jokes or simple homage, others can be quite thought-provoking and insightful. By observing how Rick and Morty inverts common cliches and tropes, we can better understand one of the smartest shows on television, and why we love it so much. Welcome to this special Wisecrack edition on references in Rick and Morty. By the way, this is a slightly different format from how we've done things in the past, so if you like it, let us know what you think in the comments. The Devil Comes to Town in the episode Something Ricked This Way Comes, Rick and Morty uses the arrival of Satan to turn the idea of deal with the devil on its head. The episode title comes from Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes, a novel about some weird carnies with a magical carousel that enables people to become younger or older at will. Of course, there's a catch, and anybody who benefits from this magic also becomes beholden to the evil of the carnival. Making deals with creepy strangers is also a theme in Stephen King's novel Needful Things, which, surprise, is the name of the Devil's Shop of Oddities in Rick and Morty. In the book, people are tricked into buying garbage that appears to be rare or valuable at a very low cost. The catch? In exchange for a great deal, you must play a few pranks on your neighbors that end up throwing the town into a kind of civil war. In Rick and Morty, the devil opens up a shop where the items are free, but also creatively ruin whatever benefit one hopes to receive. Rick gets a magic microscope that will make him too stupid to use it. Morty's math teacher gets an aftershave that attracts women, but also makes him impotent. Stories about making a deal with the devil often reflect the hidden consequences that result from trying to thwart the natural order of things in order to fulfill your selfish desires. In good Rick and Morty fashion, the show takes this moral refrain and throws it in the toilet. Agreed! I deserve this! The serum should counteract the negative effects. In Rick's version of the story, you can have everything you want because science. It detects and catalogs all your Twilight Zone, Ray Bradbury, Friday the 13th, the series voodoo crap magic. No need to sell your soul or deal with a debilitating curse to get what you want. I use science to uncurse the items for cash and you get to keep the powers. With science, there are no mystical repercussions for messing with the perceived order of things. You can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Just as science demystifies religion by exposing magic and miracles as either sleight of hand or mere statistical coincidence, does evil exist? And if so, can one detect and measure it? Um. Rhetorical question, Morty. The answer is yes, you just have to be a genius. Rick demystifies the deal with the devil trope as nothing more than a paranoid fairy tale. What these stories often portray as too good to be true is usually just shorthand for don't circumvent God's rules, which is the preferred pastime of every scientist. Scientist Scientifically, traditions are an idiot thing. With science, Rick renders the devil obsolete. That's the real lesson here. Evil isn't what should horrify us anymore. Karmic retribution is kinda calming. Evildoers will eventually face cosmic justice. A world without this is scary in its own right. And while the devil may be terrifying, if you want to find something really scary, you need to look beyond evil and take a look at pure, disinterested science. Or as the devil puts it, I may be the devil, but your grandpa is the devil. Resistance is futile. In autoerotic assimilation, Rick and Morty takes popular fears of conformity to criticize our basic values and explore Rick's inner psyche. In the episode, Rick runs into his ex-girlfriend Unity, Hello, Rick. who assimilates alien races into her hive mind collective by puking into their mouths. It's a reference to the 1956 film Invasion of the Body Snatchers, although the idea of aliens turning us into some sort of zombie collective has become a familiar trope in science fiction. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is about an alien assault that replaces people with creepy, emotionless replicas of themselves, similar to Unity's assimilated subjects. Invasion of the Body Snatchers has been read by many film critics as a commentary on the then impending threat of the Soviet Union and the loss of individualism under communist rule. And you're reborn into an untroubled world. Where everyone's the same. Exactly. What a world. 
One way Rick and Morty inverts the Body Snatchers story is by demonstrating that the freedom we associate with individualism can actually kind of suck. Whereas the invasion of the Body Snatchers projects an anxiety about communism destroying individualism, Rick and Morty shows us the very not fictional horrors of our own freedoms. Steven, set yourself free! Summer, before I took over this planet, this man was a registered sex offender. The denizens of Unity's planet recall their previous lives as sex offenders and drug addicts, and their liberation from the collective whole sparks a nipple-driven race war. I didn't know freedom meant people doing stuff that sucks. This tension between individual freedom and a collective existence further develops Rick's character. You see, I've, I've reconnected with my family, right? After all, being a part of a family or in a relationship is really about compromising your individual freedoms for the good of the group. What if you did it for me? What if you came with us as a favor to us? Because you love us. What? Dumb. Bye. Throughout the entire series, Rick's rampant egotism impedes his relationship with his family. Likewise, in autoerotic assimilation, Rick's egotism not only destroys his relationship with Unity, but her entire society. I think Unity's great and you're a horrible influence on it. And of course, in Unity's letter to Rick, it's actually Rick who makes Unity lose her sense of self in their relationship. I'm sure there's no perfect version of me. I'm sure I'll just unify species after species and never really be complete. As a bonus, the show on TV is a recreation of Community, Dan Harmon's show before Rick and Morty. Now make them all make fun of the blonde one. Now make them all do it on the table. Now cancel it. Okay, now put it back on. <laughs> its main character, Jeff Winger, is, like Rick, also an egotistical asshole trying to make sense of what it means to be around people who care about him. Fine, 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 go ahead, mock me. The penis is evil. The 1974 film Zardoz is one of the more obscure references to play a prominent role in the show. If you've been exposed to Zardoz, it's likely through an internet meme Sean Connery wearing, uh, this. Or a giant floating head vomiting up guns saying, The gun is good. Penis is evil. Rick and Morty is in some ways thematically similar to Zardoz, and uses the film as a basis for the episode Raising Gazorpazorp. In Zardoz, a giant floating head god commands some chosen savages to go murder the rest of the savages. One of these chosen savages, Zed, discovers his giant floating head god is a lie and that it was all some convoluted plan to enslave the savages in service of some immortal aristocrats. Well, obviously, Summer, it appears the lower tier of this society is being manipulated through sex and advanced technology by a hidden ruling class. Sound familiar? Raising Gazorpazorp takes the plot and changes a few details. The conflict between immortals and savages is replaced by men and women. The penis is still evil. What are you in for? Because I got I got a big, you know, penis between my legs. But it's all precipitated because Morty wants a sex doll. The Zardoz reference follows up on a general theme of atheism in the show. In this tale, I am a fake god by occupation. Zardoz is a movie about a guy who discovers his god is a lie and proceeds to kill that god. Rick and Morty is a show reminding us that either there is no god, there is no god in your face, or that god isn't all that great. My god's the biggest dick that's never existed. All Ricks are created equal, but some are more equal than others. The episode Lawnmower Dog borrows its title from the 1992 film Lawnmower Man, a movie about a dumb gardener who's turned into a crazy genius by Pierce Brosnan. In Lawnmower Dog, Rick makes the family pooch Snuffles smart enough to stop peeing on the rug, but by accident also smart enough to subjugate the entire human race. Snuffles rejects his slave name in favor of Snowball. Snuffles. Do not call me that. <laughs> Snuffles was my slave name. You shall now call me Snowball. A reference to the pig and Leon Trotsky stand-in from George Orwell's Animal Farm. Snowball seems to be a pretty popular name for revolutionary animals these days, as the antagonist of Secret Life of Pets also shares the name. The interspecies war that transpires in Rick and Morty is similar to the war waged by the creatures of Animal Farm against their human masters. Whereas the farm animals rebel against their labor being exploited by lazy humans, Snuffles rebels against the lazy life of pethood. You will walk when it is time to walk. In the book, the rebellious animals slowly turn into the farmers that they had fought against. The final scene shows pigs standing on two feet and wearing clothes, completing the transformation into their former overlords. In Rick and Morty, with the help of Inception... It's just like that movie that you keep crowing about. You talking about Inception? That's right, Morty. This is gonna be a lot like that, except, you know, it's gonna maybe make sense. A dystopian nightmare is averted when Snowball realizes he's slowly turning into everything he hated about humanity. Taking over the human's world will lead to nothing but more heartbreak, more cruelty. The episode also makes a few references to Dog World, a series concept developed by show co-creator Justin Roiland. 
It features a family who gets transported to an alternate dimension where the world is run by dogs. The pet human is named Ruffles, which Rick mistakenly calls Snuffles in Lawnmower Dog. All right, Ruffles, what's his name? Snuffles. Also, at the end of the episode, when the dogs leave to populate a new dimension, Rick makes a smooth pitch for the development of Dog World as its own show. I think it'll be great, Morty. You know, it's, it, it, it could be developed in, into a very satisfying project for people of all ages. I mean, I'd watch it, Morty, for at least 11 minutes a pop. Destroying Your Childhood there are too many references to fairy tales, science fiction, and horror to list, but many of them further this idea of disillusionment central to the show. When the show isn't deconstructing mysticism with hard science, I'm dropping to my knees and pledging my eternal soul to the thing that literally controls the f***ing weather. It's deconstructing fantasies by subjecting them to the mundaneity of everyday life. Me Seeks and Destroy is the most overt example of this. Morty brings Rick on a cliche fairy tale adventure, raising money for a poor village by playing out the story from Jack and the Beanstalk. To summarize the fairy tale, a boy robs a giant unprovoked, kills him, and lives his life happily ever after with his stolen riches without suffering any consequences. The show normalizes the fairy tale by subjecting it to a level of realism usually omitted from children's stories. <laughs> dispelling the cheery optimism that comforted you as a child. Instead of ending the story with some bullshit about happily ever after, Morty is put on trial for his senseless murder and confronted with the emotionally devastated widow of the giant. Also, the village's king turns out to be a sexual predator. In another episode, we're introduced to Scary Terry, a legally safe knockoff of Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. While Scary Terry may seem terrifying, with his ability to murder you in your dreams and all, his life is utterly banal. The show dispels the horror of Freddy Krueger with the same kind of normalization. The tormentor of dreams, as it turns out, has the same shitty home life as the rest of us, GET OFF MY BACK, BITCH, and is scared of the same lame dreams. Anatomy Park is a reference to both Jurassic Park and Fantastic Voyage. Rick and Morty shows that the human body, which is often portrayed by movies like Fantastic Voyage as a wonder of the natural world, I never imagined it could be anything like this, is just a gonorrhea-infested nightmare. If there's one humorous device that Rick and Morty uses more than any other, it's robbing fantasy of its magic. It trivializes everything. Nothing you do matters, your existence is a lie! Not only fairy tales, but family, love, and even life. Hey guys, thanks for watching. This is a new kind of video for us, so if you liked it and want to see more, make sure to tell us in the comments below. And if you love Rick and Morty as much as we do, jump through this dimensional portal to visit our friend Matt Pat at The Film Theorist. He's got a video explaining the cliffhanger at the end of Rick and Morty Season 2. Sure, Rick's in intergalactic prison now, but do you know why? The show left some pretty interesting clues as to what really makes Rick a wanted man. And it's not what you might think. So jump through this portal to visit The Film Theorist and find out. And to make sure you don't miss our upcoming Wisecrack videos, click here to be taken to our channel page where you can watch another video and subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys. For our next video, I've got to tap into the dark side. Squanch you later. Peace.